All right, well, joining us now is J.D. Miser, who's a Ph.D. candidate in economic geology at the University of Arizona here in Tucson. And J.D. is not only a Ph.D. candidate, but just received the Courtright Scholarship from the Arizona Geologic Society. So he's giving a talk later today on vein-hosted silver mineralization in the Sarah, Colorado district, which I understand is based on your dissertation. That's right. It's a, it's a portion of my research here in Arizona, which is um, uh, builds on earlier works that was done in the starting in the mid '50s up through uh, the late '90s, actually, and trying to discern uh, mineral distribution, primarily uh, minerals that contain silver, as their zoning of the silver in this district, um, and what might that mean? What is the age? of the mineralization in the district. So uh, it's just, we started with mapping and building on some of these earlier works. And, and the mapping is, is uh, as it always does, is bringing up some interesting findings. <laughs> so what are you going to share with the group here in your talk later today? So my talk today is um, going to summarize my findings from the mapping about the veins that uh, dominantly calcite and quartz veins that have uh, silver mineralization in them and those generally strike northeast and southwest and then there's another set of later veins that are east-west dominantly quartz uh, with primary silver sulfide mineralization uh, um, tetrahedrite uh, galena and um, covalite and acanthite so what does that mean for either exploration for these kinds of deposits or trying to develop something like that yeah, so that's a good question. One of the things that we're hoping to come out of this is uh, um, generally are these uh, mineral distributions in these veins, do they vary across the district? Is there a, a radial pattern in these veins that may, they may emanate from some deeper, more distal source? Um, and doing a detailed alteration map of the district kind of tells us where we should look for either bigger veins that may be you know, economically feasible to exploit in the future, um, or if we should look elsewhere. So, you know, uh, The fact that you've been doing geologic mapping, in a lot of programs nationwide, mapping is, people say, oh, we don't need to do mapping. We right. just need to sit in the laboratory or sit in front of our computers right. and do some kind of computational work. But I think what, what you're showing us is the importance of being on the ground and understanding those relationships, they aren't fully understood, and many of these areas are not fully mapped yet. That's right, that's right. And some of the earlier works um, by Dick Jones and Kevin Horseman, mm -hmm. uh, there was a, a fair amount of mapping in the district. It was usually focused or pointed on a specific outcrop or specific mm -hmm. um, mine or prospect in the district. This project is taking all of those earlier works providing more detail and um, there's there's just there's no way to get around boots on the ground doing right. detailed mapping and uh, it always leads to something new and, and having only done it now for about eight months in this particular area uh, the, the fallout is just phenomenal what we're finding so wow yeah well you brought a couple of samples yes here. yeah so can you show us what, what you've got here so um, do we need to turn this up a little bit more to uh, make sure we can capture that with the... Yeah. Yeah. So in this district, what we get is early massive quartz veining that has primary sulfide mineralization, uh, often tetrahedrite, sometimes calcocite, sometimes acanthite, um, and sometimes covalite. And this particular sample, you can see the, the silver mineralization in the early quartz veins and these have been brecciated and then re-cemented by later uh, calcite or siderite material. Um, interestingly enough, I mean this sample is clearly the mineralization is early pre-brecciation and then this specimen is a little different in that it shows the, uh, you still have early quartz mineralization um, possibly brecciated, cemented by calcite or siderite but then we've got silver mineralization right. that, that's right. Across that the brecciated boundary there. Right. right. So we don't know if there's there are multiple generations of mineralization. Both of these specimens contain a fair amount of silver. Um, 
but the timing in which all this occurred is something that, that we're interested in in this district as well. So, so little details like this tell us a lot about the district. So, Well, I'm impressed. It uh, looks like there's a pretty high concentration. Yes, yeah, some of these, uh, the district has historically produced a lot of silver. Um, mm -hmm. Most of the silver production was pre-1900s uh, um, mm -hmm. at a couple of high-grade producing um, silver mines, namely the Cerro Colorado or Heinzelman mine. And some of the grades in the mine were in the thousands of ounces per ton of silver. Ba basically, <laughs> almost pure native silver was reported to have come out of this location. And a lot of the smaller outlying prospects are not that rich, never, never really were, but they were definitely mined, um, clearly mined for a couple of decades at least, and produced uh, pretty modest amounts of silver as well. So, Well, I don't want to put you on the spot, but are you finding suggestions that mining ought to come back and take a look at this area again? Well, I think um, my personal interest in, in projects like this, especially here in southern Arizona, is these, these uh, distal re replacement deposits or vein-hosted deposits um, may or may not be associated with a larger mineralizing event. Um, this particular district, it's a little early to tell if uh, there's a resource here that bears enough silver to be economic. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit more mapping, I think, we'll know, we'll know more of that. Um, and what, one of the questions I'm trying to answer is, does this mineralization in these veins tie into a more distal source? Is it restricted to a local event? Mm -hmm. uh, the timing of these, which we should know, uh, geo, we, we should know a little more about the geochronology here within the next month or two. Mm -hmm. And that will tell us um, how, how uh, intensely we should look and what we should look for in this particular area. And that, again, this is just a small portion of a regional context uh, project that involves uh, Jurassic Age rocks, Laramide Age rocks, and tertiary volcanics. So there's a lot of timing that <laughs> you're covering a couple of hundred million years of That's geologic right. history, it sounds like, over a fairly That's right. broad area. Right. And so narrowing down, and there are other uh, minerals and uh, metals of interest in this area. and. Again, this, this is a small portion that if we can constrain it, then it will tell us where to look and, and where to go from here. Wow. When do you expect to, uh, to wrap up your dissertation work? Um, so this, I, I'm still in my second year. Okay. So I still have a couple years left. Okay. And uh, my goal is to build a Laramide, a regional context for the Laramide of, of how systems, small systems like this may or may not uh, be related to or connected to larger mineralizing systems and we're, we're in the heart of porphyry copper down here in the southwest and uh, these historically these silver lead zinc and silver um, mines and prospects usually lie around or near porphyry copper event mm -hmm. we have yet to see you know whether or not that's the case here uh, but as part of uh, my dis dissertation research in general uh, we'll see how other systems similar to this relate to porphyry copper in other uh, districts throughout the Southwest. Well, depending on your results, this could have huge impact for exploration for the entire region. It could, it could. I mean, it's not, um, this is, uh, it's a common theme, recurring theme. We find these distal base, base and precious metal deposits with or near porphyries, uh, whether that's the case uh, here at Sierra Colorado is yet to be seen, um, but the focus of this project is the silver, and a majority of the, the funding for this project is focused on the, the silver in the district and, and what is going to be potentially economically feasible in the future. So, wow. it's exciting. That is. Uh, well, congratulations, one, on the Courtright Scholarship. Thank you. And uh, this is an exciting project. I'm expecting we're going to invite you back at some point okay. as, you, as you get further along to hear more about this or as some of your papers and talks come out. We'll want to uh, see how the progress is going on. My pleasure. But thank you for joining us today, and best of luck as you continue your, your mapping and your research. Great. Thank you, Lee. Thanks.